isn't God good? Isn't he amazing? And uh, what, what an honor it is to be here to share. I feel, uh, oh, uh, you know, Ephesians is just such an amazing book. I'm just like, Lord, you just have to do it. Like, I, I, there's, he just has to bring revelation to us. There's such depth in this book. And so as I've been working and praying over this chapter this week, I've been like, God, there's just so much more to it. And so I just want us to pray that our eyes will be open to see and, and to know the more of God that he has. And uh, so Ephesians 3, as I searched and, and for the primary word in this chapter, it's Christ Jesus, Christ and Christ Jesus. And so he's the one that we're here to know today. We're not here to know some more facts about a book from the Bible. We're here to know and see the man Christ Jesus. And that's your calling for all eternity. Is you're going to be gazing upon his majesty and seeing more and more of his beauty for the next billion years. And he actually is reality this morning. He is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. And, and so we're going to begin this morning by partaking of communion. And so if you could find the communion elements there and begin trying to open them, and may the grace of God be upon you to be able to open. I'm sure if we lived, if the scripture is being written today, that would be in there somewhere, you know. And may the grace of God make it that you're one of the ones who's able to open their communion and participate. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. We thank you for the crown of thorns that you bore. We thank you for the lashes, for the beating. The Lord, that you took our sin, our sickness, our junk. And that you have given us all your riches. And that you have made us new. You have made us your beautiful temples. You've made us your masterpieces because of your body. You have given us freedom. And so, Father, let there be in this place a revelation of the man Christ Jesus. That we will know him like we've never known him. And we thank you, Jesus, for your body. Jesus, thank you for your blood, every drop of your blood. Thank you for the power of the blood. There is power, wonder-working power, in the blood of the Lamb. And so, Lord, we cannot partake of this this morning and be the same. We cannot glimpse upon your majesty we cannot partake of the blood and stay the same. And so, Father, I thank you that there is a shifting in bodies right now as we partake of the blood. I thank you there's a shifting in minds. I thank you that there's a revelation of Jesus as we partake of the blood. Jesus be known. Jesus be seen. Jesus be felt in this place today. Jesus be heard in this place today, in fullness, in fullness be known. And we thank you that it's all possible because of your blood. And we receive the fullness of what you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you're ready to launch into Ephesians? Grab your Bible. 
And, uh, you know, the first three chapters in the New Testament, especially in the writings of Paul, he spends the first part of the chapters, he doesn't usually just launch in and say, do this. He spends the first part of the, of the book telling us who we are and what we've been given. Because once you know who you are and what you've been given, then you live out of that and can do what he's called you to do. And so it's very important for us as we're teaching, as we're leading our families, that we bring them into the fullness of identity of who they are in Christ, of what we've been given, and then out of that, we go into what he's called us to do. And so you're going to see a shifting next week as we start into chapter 4 that he's going to talk about how to walk this out. But it's very significant that we've spent three chapters as the Apostle Paul is doing everything he can to try to get on paper the majesty, the wonder, the beauty of what Christ Jesus has done and the fullness of what he has given to us, of what we have been given through the cross. Verse 1, so for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. Isn't this amazing that here's Paul, he's in a Roman prison, you know, which would make our prisons look like a five-star hotel. (laughs) And he's in this prison, and the first thing he tells us is like, hey, I may be in a prison and a Roman centurion may think that I'm his prisoner, but I'm not his prisoner. (laughs) I am not a victim. I am not a prisoner to my circumstance. I am not limited to the bars and the chains that are on me. I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. And that's just such an inspiring way to live, that we are not prisoner of our circumstances. We are not prisoners of things that are going on here in our nation right now. We are prisoners of Christ Jesus. And so this is the perspective that that he begins with, that I have been captured Uh, by Jesus Christ himself. And if I'm a prisoner of anyone, I'm a prisoner of him. And I'm a prisoner of this gospel. And and we're going to see even at at the end of chapter 6, he says, says, I'm an ambassador in chains. And pray for me that I may proclaim the the gospel boldly. So I'm not a prisoner of my circumstances, but I am a prisoner Of Christ Jesus. For the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you've heard of the stewardship, say stewardship. Stewardship. Now, this word stewardship implies that you, he's been given something very precious. Stewardship means that something valuable has been given. To him, and and so Paul is saying here, I have been God's by God's grace, I have been given something precious, something that I'm to give to you, and and actually, as you read read the New Testament, we're all stewards of the grace of God. You have been given something that no amount of money can buy. You know, and it's like here he's saying, like, God's given me something that's worth more than billions of dollars. That he's entrusted it to me. And part of stewardship is recognizing the immensity of what you've been given and entrusted with. That something incredibly precious has been given to you. 
Something incredibly precious, the gift of God's grace has been given to me and I'm going to give it to you. And so it's like if I said, you know, I said, hey, you know, Sean, here's a billion dollars and I want you to take it and I want you to give it to the nation of Ethiopia. Well, I have, I have entrusted Sean with a lot. That would really tax my savings account. <laughs> and he knows that he has something extremely valuable. And so he is going to go and he is going to make sure that what he has been given is released. And, and so... Paul is saying, I am a steward of the grace of God. And isn't it interesting that, that walking in God's grace too, and he's going to talk about grace. It's another one of the words that's it's found three times in this chapter. That Paul is walking in the grace of God. And sometimes we think the grace of God takes us above everything, but sometimes the grace of God takes you through things. And so here's Paul talking about the grace of God while he's in prison. And sometimes the grace of God actually is revealed. It says that his power is perfected in our weakness. And so he's stewarding the grace of God in prison And it's going to be released. It has given it to me for you, the Gentiles. I have been entrusted with something that is incredibly precious. If indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you. And we've already talked some about the grace of God in the earlier chapters. Grace is the empowering presence of God, enabling you to be who he's called you to be. And do what he's called you to do. Aren't you thankful today for the grace of God? That the empowering presence of God has been given to you. That that he didn't just call you and tell you to do some things and kind of, you know, good luck. (laughs) You're on your own, you know. But the grace of God is like a river empowering you from within. Carrying you. Enabling you to do what you could never do on your own. In your weakness, the grace of God being even stronger through you. That by revelation, say revelation. There was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief. Now, this, this word revelation, the Greek word, it actually it means to uncover. A revelation, I used to think of revelation, that like revelation was like God showing you something, but something that, but something that wasn't really real. It was like, you know, kind of making something up and you got, you got a revelation. But that's not what a revelation is. Revelation is actually seeing what is really real. It's actually that your eyes are open to see reality. (laughs) Because reality this morning (laughs) isn't red chairs. (laughs) Reality is Jesus. And everything we see in the visible realm came from the invisible realm. Reality is the invisible realm. And so a revelation is when your eyes are open to see what's really real. And so he's saying, I, there was an uncovering, there was an unveiling to see reality. And aren't you thankful that we don't have to wait until someday to receive revelation from God? You're actually here today because you've already had a revelation of Jesus. But you're going to grow in your revelation of Jesus for all eternity. I believe you're going to grow in your revelation of him this morning. I believe I'm going to grow in my revelation of him. And this is the journey of our lives again for all eternity. That we're going to be before the throne of God. And we're not going to be going, oh, another day just to gaze upon Jesus. You know, they didn't find, couldn't find anything else for us to do. <laughs> Is 
There is nothing else you can do when his majesty is present and revealed. But look and gaze at the wonder of who he is. And, and for the next billion years, we're going to be seeing more and more. And every day is going to be like the first time. And you're going to get a glimpse and know that there was more to him than you ever could have imagined. That his riches are unsearchable and inexhaustible. And unfathomable. <laughs> there is so much to see and know of him. And so he says that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, the mystery of Christ. And by referring to this when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. And can we just say that this is an amazing time, an amazing generation to be a part of right now. And we need to live in gratitude and thanksgiving for all that God is doing. That we live in the time when Somehow you heard the gospel <laughs> and God chose you. And we live in a time where the spirit of God is moving all over the earth. Incredible things are happening right now. And, and so we, need, we, we don't need to be weighed down. We need to be looking at what he's doing and saying, God, how can I partner with what you're doing? You are powerful, and the grace of God is on your life, the empowering presence of God, and you are a steward of something that is powerful, powerful to change your workplace, powerful to change your neighborhood. The grace of God is powerful to change nations. God can change a nation in a day. He's not up in heaven right now wringing his hands over 2024. He is seated, seated on a throne laughing, knowing, confident in what he's doing in your life right now. Confident in what he's doing in the Metroplex right now. In this generation, in this time, and this has been, I was just talking with my sons just this week about how it is. This is an unprecedented time in our area as far as the, the purifying. We were, we were looking through like what, there, where there have been like 12 to 14 different shifts of, of pastors and leaders having to shift out of leadership in this time. I don't ever remember a time like this in my lifetime. And so we need to be going really low right now. And we need to be saying, God, find us ready for what you're about to pour out. Because he is up to something and our region is marked. And the prophecies that have been spoken over this area and the fire of God. And this being a global center of revival, we need to dust them off again. And not forget what God has said and what he's doing. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, fellow members, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus uh, through the gospel. This is good news. Any Gentiles in the room this morning? This is really good news. And he's gone to every length here to say like, hey, by the way, you're all the way in. <laughs> you're, a, you're a fellow heir? You're in the inheritance, you're a fellow member, you're part of the family, and you're a fellow partaker you get to share and in the promise of Christ Jesus through the gospel. So that is absolutely incredible what, what we have been given. Of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's 
Somebody say grace. The gift of God's grace. Again, his empowering presence. To me, the very least of all these saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. And again, as I said, the word grace is, is three times in the chapter. And so it, it, this is a very important uh, theme, actually, in this whole book, the grace of God. Verse 9. You still there? Yeah. All right. To bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So that the manifold wisdom of God, that word in the Greek means many colored. It, it's a, a word that was used to describe a work of art. The many colored work of art, beautiful, amazing wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities, say, in the heavenly places. Now, it was such a good illustration. I'm never going to forget that with the chairs up here last week. Um, of, of the fact that we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. And, and so, when you look at and search for heavenly places, it's actually talked about five different times here in, in the book of Ephesians. This was my... Ephesians heavenly place uh, search. And, and so, one, we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. But where are those blessings? All right. So, next verse, we see that Jesus is seated in the heavenly places at the right hand of the Father. And then we see number three there, Ephesians 2, last week. That he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. So this is really good news because where's every spiritual blessing? Oh, really? Where are you? So what do you have access to? Yes, in the heavenly places. So we're going to get really comfortable with this, that the heavenly places are already your home. This isn't your home. You're visiting here temporarily, <laughs> but this is not your home. And so, number four, we're looking at right now, so the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. And this is a very interesting, you know, it, this is also mentioned like this in Ephesians 6. And a lot of people, and I, I agree with this, that as, as it's saying that we're made that the wisdom of God is made known through the church to the rulers and authorities. In Ephesians 6, it refers to this only in a sense of negative forces, of, of, of evil forces. But I think here in 3, we also may be referring to all the spiritual forces. <laughs> in all, <laughs> you know, the angels, all the heavenly beings... And, and so the manifold wisdom of God is being made known through the church. And then we see Ephesians 6. Um, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. So just to break that down for you, what's going on in the heavenly places is, one, every spiritual blessing is there. Jesus is there, seated at the right hand of the Father. You are there. Right now, seated with Jesus and the Father. But now we're learning that the church is making known in that realm the wisdom of God. And then finally, the book ends that this is also a place of battle in the heavenlies. And you can imagine that if Jesus is there and every spiritual blessing is there, that there, there is a battle going on. And we have the church making known the wisdom of God. Made known. Can you say through the church? Church 
The ecclesia of God is not just another mountain. <laughs> you know, sometimes when we're teaching the seven, the seven mountains, and, I, and I'm thankful that there's such a good kingdom message that's in that, but sometimes we made it like church is another mountain, but I want to tell you something. The wisdom of God is being made known to the authorities in the heavenly places through the church. And so this is quite an amazing thing that, that we see here. Um, and, you know, Jesus said it in Matthew 16. I was trying really hard to only put up verses from Ephesians, um, but I just had to put this up. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build what? My church, my my ecclesia, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you, who's you? Us, the church. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The power to really do things that count in the realm that counts, rest with the church. And so whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And so the word church used in the scripture, it's, an, it's interesting that Jesus chose this word because there were other words that especially in a Jewish background that you would be much more familiar with. And he chooses this secular Greek and Roman word, ecclesia, which was used to refer to a secular institution operating in the marketplace in a governmental capacity. And so when the Bible talks about the gates of hell not prevailing against us, it's not a picture of like the church you know, hiding in these walls, in these buildings, trying to make it through, you know, all the difficulties. No, the picture is the church progressing and taking ground and advancing the kingdom. And so he says here, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is going to be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. What an amazing thing that is. And this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. Wow. And so now we're going to look and launch into the second apostolic prayer that's in Ephesians. And I've, I've written for you here just where the different apostolic, the primary apostolic prayers, there's other short prayers uh, that you can find, but these are the primary apostolic prayers um, and I want to encourage you to, to look these up and to pray them. And as you pray them, if you pray them enough, eventually you'll memorize them. And uh, this is, is something that I, that I pray through quite often. And so when you pray the word of God, you know you're, you know you're praying the will of God. This is our prayer manual right here. And so there's this confidence that I'm praying the word of God and I know I'm praying. I know I'm praying the will of God. And so Paul is going to launch into this amazing prayer here. And he says, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. (laughs) And I want to park here for a second because... Your family is not an accident. Your family, the name of your family, God dreamed up your family. That's what it's saying right here. And so if God dreamed up your family, he has a destiny and a dream and a purpose for your family. Whether it's been manifest 
for generations or not. He still has a dream, a destiny, and a purpose for your family. And we need to be praying for it and declaring it. Lord, I thank you for my family and for what you have destined and called my family to walk in. Because you named my family. And you dreamed it up. And so we just declare even right now redemption over families. We declare restoration of what's been stolen from your family in Jesus' name. Because someone named your family. And and if someone named something, they have authority over it. And so we declare the authority of Jesus and restoration over your family in the name of Jesus, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. And so Paul here is saying, as great, as abundant as his riches are, that's the greatness, the level of greatness to which you get to be strengthened. Did you get it? Okay, so if you serve a God who has a a little bit, a little riches, (laughs) a little glory, and you're going to be strengthened according to that, then how much strength are you going to have? A little strength. But if you serve a God whose glory is limitless, whose riches cannot be counted or even fathomed, And he says, you're going to be strengthened according to that. How much strength is available to you right now? (laughs) Sometimes I think it's a miracle that we don't just blow up. I mean, you read a scripture like that, I'm like, uh, help me, my body to handle it, Lord. Yes, through his spirit in the inner man. So I pray that to the level of the riches of his glory, that you would to that level be strengthened with power from within. Yes, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. That word dwell means to be at home, that your heart would be a place where Jesus really feels at home. And that you being rooted, that's an agricultural, biological word, that you would be rooted and grounded, that's, this is an architectural building word, so that you would be rooted and grounded in love, that your, your feet would be firmly rooted in the love of God, in a way that nothing will shake you out of the love of God. That whatever comes your way, your feet cannot be taken out of the love of God and off the foundation of the love of God. So that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and I, I just want to—I want to hit here. I, this is something I had never seen before, because we're about to talk about comprehending the love of God and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. But as we comprehend, we comprehend with who? I'd always just pictured this in such an individualistic mindset. That I'm, I'm getting a revelation of love straight from God. And I am getting a revelation of love straight from God. But also, I'm getting a revelation of the love of God in this room. As I'm connected, I'm comprehending, not just alone, but I'm comprehending the love of God with all of the saints of God. 
Because you manifest the love of God, no one manifests the love of God exactly like you. And so the love of God through you is also increasing my revelation of who God is because I see him in you. And I know love with the saints. And that's one of the reasons it's an important thing to hang out with some saints. Look at the person next to you. Say, hey, you're a saint. I I like hanging out with you, you know. (laughs) And to know the love of Christ (laughs) that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up with to all the fullness of God. So... Your revelation of love is growing, and as your revelation of love is growing, that is enabling you to be filled up with more of the fullness of God. Knowing more of the love of God opens you to receive more of the fullness of God. All right. So to him who's able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according, and I, I, think, I think it's the word imagine would be better with the context, and this Greek word can go either way. Think, especially in our culture, takes it to such a low level. <laughs> beyond all that we can ask or even imagine, according to the power that works where? Within us. <laughs> that power is within us. I mean, this would be an amazing verse. You're like, where is he going to go with this? Where is this amazing power? You know, it could be power that's coming to us. Whatever. This power is within us. <laughs> so this power that's doing this abundantly, this wild, crazy prayer, which... This man is praying from the confines of a prison cell, but he is saying, look, you don't have to be limited. (laughs) There is a realm that is without limit, and that realm operates from within you. And you have been called into that. And so it's like he's ending this chapter now, and it's not, this isn't just a nice, cute doxology. He is saying, look, all of these riches, these abundance, and this grace upon your life. And you've been seated in the heavenly places, and you you declare with authority to the heavenlies, in the heavenlies, The manifold wisdom of God is being made known through you. And then he comes here and he's like, you, (laughs) you cannot afford to pray small prayers. (laughs) This, guys, is so, is so big. He's like, You gotta go and you gotta pray beyond, beyond, beyond. Yeah, you've you've been asking, you've been thinking, you've been contemplating, but there's far more. (laughs) There's far more. And and so it's like he's calling us into a, a higher realm according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Now, I want you to stand, and uh, we're going to go back, and we're going to pray. We're going to pray the Word of God. And and we're just going to walk through. I just want to pray this prayer. Over, over us. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Did you deliver the billion dollars? Thank you. I knew you would. 
For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven on earth derives its name. And I just want to declare blessing over your family and restoration of what's been stolen and divine alignment for your family with the dream of the Father who created your family, with the dream of the Father who named your family. Father, I thank you for it. I thank you for every family that is represented here. Father, I thank you for forgiveness flowing in families right now. We cannot afford to hold on to unforgiveness. Through forgiveness, even many times, we begin to access what God has always destined and wanted for our families. So, Father, we thank you for every family in heaven and on earth deriving its name from you. And Father, I pray right now for each one of us in this room that you would grant us according to the level of the riches of your glory that we would be strengthened with power. And I bless you that you don't flow in just a little power from God, but you flow in power to the level of the riches of his glory. You are strengthened now with power, through His Spirit, in the inner man. So that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. And Lord, I pray that you would find here in this room right now, hearts that you can really be at home in. And that anything in the the home of our hearts that doesn't need to be there, We say, Jesus, thank you for revealing it and that you reveal it so that you can take it. Be at home in our hearts. Be at home in this house, in this community, Jesus. Be welcome. Be welcome, Lord, in the home of our hearts, but also Be welcome in the homes where we live and in what we do and in what we say. And Lord, I thank you for the foundation of love. And I bless you in the name of Jesus to be rooted, that you have deep roots in love, that the winds and the storms of life Do not take you out of the love of God because you are rooted. And in those times, you, your roots grow deeper. And you are rooted and grounded, a firm foundation of love in your life. For our kids and our youth, Lord, a firm foundation of love rooted and grounded in love, God, in a way that only you can do so that we would be able to comprehend the breadth and length and height and depth. Father, may all of the dimensions of your love be known in this house. May they be known in each individual. Father, would you take us from places where love for us is still in a single dimension? And would you expand our revelation of the multi-dimensional love of God? May it explode within you. May you know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the amazing love of God that surpasses knowledge that goes way beyond what you could figure out and may you be filled to all the fullness of God
And God, I thank you that you're an exceeding abundantly God. And I thank you, Lord, that revelation of the riches of the greatness of who you are takes us out of small thinking. It takes us out of confinement. This is so much the opposite of poverty. Lord, I thank you that you're smashing poverty right now. How can it stay when you are abundantly beyond all that we can ask or imagine according to the power that works within us? And so right now, I want you, I want you to look at what you've been praying and I want you to pray beyond it. In fact, I want you to pray something that, that your mind tells you it's crazy. And you, know, you wanna know what? That's probably not even close <laughs> to what this describes. But I want you just right there where you are, I want you just to pray some prayers for just a moment. I want you to pray some crazy prayers because you have a crazy big God and you're seated in the heavenlies. And the power is working within you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. <laughs> Thank you. Exceedingly, abundantly, beyond. Beyond. Father, we pray beyond. We pray beyond our safe borders that we've been praying with. We pray beyond that comfort zone. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. I want us to, uh, I want us to just shout this out. I want us to, I want us to do it three times. Making this declaration of glory to our God and to Christ Jesus. You ready? All right, here we go. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever, amen. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever, amen.